Go. All right, we're ready. My name's Doug French. It is 1430, and I'm here to talk about the elephant, uh, ethics of default. Thank you for showing up after lunch. I know there's a lot of things to do on a sunny afternoon in Bodrum. So I'm honored that you're here, honored to be asked to speak. It's one of my uh, two or three speaking parts this weekend. This will be longer than my other speaking parts. Um, the ethics of default come from uh, this, most, most of this is from a little book, very thin book. Uh, you know, my girl wishes I had thicker books. She wishes I had bigger books. But uh, maybe that'll happen one of these days. But for now, uh, this, this tiny little book called uh, Walk Away, which I didn't bring any copies of. Uh, I didn't realize we were peddling books this weekend. But uh, you know where to get it. It's online at Mises.org. And you can either get it for free or you can buy it. And I believe we charge eight bucks for this or something like that. So anyway, strategic default um, is really uh, the bedrock of what I'm going to talk about. And strategic default is when a homeowner stops paying on their mortgages when in fact they can afford to pay. But they choose not to pay because the collateral value supporting that loan has fallen way below the loan balance. Now I'm not talking about people who take out a loan and never make a payment. I'm talking about people who borrowed in good faith to buy an asset, or maybe they refinanced in good faith um, during the bubble, the housing bubble of the mid-2000s, and they made their payments until they realized that it made no sense to feed a, a mortgage that um, on a house that was worth but a fraction of what they had. And you have a number of people around the United States that this is the situation. They are thousands of dollars underwater, in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars underwater, in some cases million dollars uh, underwater. And these people can pay, but they'd be paying for a liability that will never, never, ever be an asset. So this is, this is good money after bad on stilts. But for some, uh, and for some libertarians, this issue is a no-brainer. Uh, CPA, uh, Karen DeCosta wrote on, on LewRockwell.com, she said, walk away, free yourself from the unnecessary bondage, and let the giant banks sort out the mess that they help perpetrate as well. But other libertarians would say, a contract's a contract, right? To not pay is stealing. The lender fulfilled their end of the bargain. They, they lent you the money to buy or refinance the house. The note doesn't give you an out. There's nowhere in any promissory note on a house that says, you know, if the house goes down in value, go ahead and walk away. No note ever says that. And conversely, a lot of people will say, well, listen, if the house soars in value, you borrow... 200 to buy a $200,000 house, it goes up to 300,000, you sell it, you pocket the 100,000, and the lender, the poor lender, only gets the interest that they contracted to get. So, um, this isn't a partnership, it's a straight contract deal. And, you know, private contracts are the bedrock of a free society. And thus we have this issue with, with libertarians. I mean, what would happen if people were just allowed to walk away on their obligations? I mean, it'd be chaos. But the question is, is America a free society? Is there property rights for all in America? And so I got into this issue because of some various fights uh, during email exchanges, which some people in this room were a part of, and started thinking about you know, what should people do if there are thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars underwater on their mortgage? Should they sacrifice for the rest of their life to make sure that Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, B of A, and the city corpse of the world get some money? 
Now, I start this with uh, the idea that, let's say you bought your house as a corporation, and you're the, you're the um, CEO of that corporation. And let's say uh, this is a million dollar house, and you borrowed 900000 and you put a little bit of money down, and then the market gets cut in half, you owe 900000 and the house is only worth half, or the, the house is only worth half a million dollars. Now, if you're the president of a corporation, and the corporation owned that asset, um, and, and the company has plenty of money to fund that loan, what would, the, what would they do? Well, time and time again, um, big real estate companies uh, have walked away. And it's viewed as the best thing to do. In fact, it's viewed, if they don't do that, as a violation of their fiduciary duty. Now, fiduciary duty uh, being a principle of natural law that has been incorporated in the Anglo-American legal tradition. And this pre uh, principle underlies the duties of good faith, loyalty, and care that apply to corporate officers and directors. Now, the fiduciary duty of company supervisor is the prudent management of the company uh, and the assets on behalf of the shareholders. It's not on behalf of the company's creditors or anyone else. This is on, in terms of fiduciary duty to a, person, uh, to a company's shareholders. So, in the case of, that I just laid out, where the property is hopelessly underwater, it would be um, the fiduciary duty of the company to walk away, to hand the keys to the lender and, um, and just let it have them back. And in fact, uh, Morgan Stanley did this on five buildings in San Francisco where they bought it at the height of the boom, Morgan Stanley being a lender themselves, but did they go ahead and pay on this underwater property? Of course they didn't. It was in the best fiduciary duty of the company and the shareholders that they just mailed in the keys. And believe me, Morgan Stanley had the cash to make the payments. So, and this is, um, many real estate trusts did this. And it's, you know, there was this quote in the Wall Street Journal, these companies all have piles of cash to make the payments. They are simply opting to default because they believe it makes good business sense. Now, at the same time, you may remember a guy named Hank Paulson. And Hank Paulson is, uh, he was former Secretary of Treasury, uh, now best-selling author, I believe. And he said, at the same time that these big companies were walking away and handing in the keys, Hank Paulson was saying, any homeowner who can afford his mortgage payment but chooses to walk away from an underwater property is simply a speculator and one who is not honoring his or her obligations. So while we have this savvy commercial property owners doing their fiduciary duty, we have the Hank Paulsons of the world and other high-minded folks saying, if you're the average person who bought their house in California somewhere for half a million dollars, it's now worth 250, you still owe 400, you'll never dig out of this equity hole, those people are morally wrong. While the uh, titans of the real estate industry do the right thing and walk away. Now, of course, a person can't have a fiduciary duty to themselves. It defies the explanation. Fiduciary duty means uh, doing the best thing for others, in this case, shareholders. But surely if CEOs have a fiduciary duty to shareholders, then a mortgage payer has some sort of fiduciary duty to his or her family. I mean, is a family supposed to sacrifice their entire lives, kids not going to college, maybe not being able to go to Bodrum on vacation, just so Citibank, B of A, Fannie Mae, 
can get their payments. I mean, is a family susp supposed to exhaust all savings, essentially be financially imprudent in order to satisfy this losing contract? If you're running a company, you would certainly be kicked out. You might even be you know, prosecuted in some way for not following fiduciary duty. But if you're an individual, you're browbeat into making uh, these bad financial decisions. Now, Aristotle explained that man is a rational being. And men learn, man learns, that, uh, work, it learns what works in the world, natural laws to achieve its desired ends, survival and prosperity. And Murray Rothbard explained in, in The Ethics of Liberty that he said the very fact that the knowledge needed for man's survival and progress is not innately given to him and determined by external events shows that man has the free will to either employ reason or not and that they act and an act set against his life and health would objectively be called immoral. So the idea here is if, if you act against your financial health, you're actually not being moral, you're actually being immoral, in Rothbard's words. However, in the same book, Rothbard writes, the, proper th the perfectly proper thesis that private persons or institutions should keep their contracts and pay their debts. So Rothbard says, if you have a private debt, private persons and institutions, you should keep those contracts and pay the debts. But the issue here is that the mortgage market is anything but private. In fact, 97% of the mortgages today are either guaranteed by FHA or they are bought in the secondary market by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Now, during the boom, it was not 97%, it was about 50%. But the 50% that didn't, that wasn't guaranteed by the government or purchased by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, those deals in the private market were dictated by terms set by the government lenders. So everybody tried to compete with government lenders and they set the pace for, for what a, a mortgage would look like. So to me, it's very hard to imagine that Rothbard would insist that a private individual be poorer and less prosperous in an effort to pay Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and B of A and J.P. Morgan Chase. Because these are entities that are only in business because the government has kept them in business. And that's one of the reasons that Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and these others don't negotiate with people who are underwater unless they're down on their payments. There's no reason for them to negotiate. Why don't they negotiate? It's Washington that keeps them in business, not borrowers that keep them in business. Now Rothbard goes on to make the point that relations with the state then become purely prudential and pragmatic considerations for the particular individuals involved who must treat the state as an enemy with currently prevailing power. And since government-sponsored entities, which are Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, is now considered government debt. Since they've been bailed out, there's no, it's always been government debt, there's always been this implicit guarantee that's always been placed. Um, so, since Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac debt, um, the payment on this debt is by taxpayers, it is coercion. So the funding of GSEs, the, the funds that they use um, to buy these mortgages in the first place is obtained in Rothbard's view through coercion and aggression against private property. And in no way is that ever licit. Such coercion can never be licit from a libertarian point of view, according to Rothbard. And Rothbard, if you remember, always advocated that government debt should be repudiated. The entire government outright, he said, let the chips fall where they may, just let government bonds be, uh, just repudiate the debt, and whoever's holding it will take the loss. 
And in the same article, Rothbard ridicules the Social Security uh, Administration because it, quote, has government bonds in its portfolio and collects interest and payment from the American taxpayer, allowing it to masquerade as a legitimate insurance business. So when you think about it in that terms, the Social Security Administration acting as a insurance company, but they're not, they're just this phony Ponzi scheme, then if, to me, it would be hard to imagine that Rothbard would view Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac as a legitimate mortgage business. And he went on to write that if the idea of repudiating the debt was too harsh, um, then he said at least put the federal government in bankruptcy. He said, first we have to rid ourselves of the fallacious mindset that conflates public and private and that treats government debt as if it were a productive contract between two legitimate property owners. Now, if Fannie and Freddie and the rest were allowed to go bankrupt, the mortgages would be assets in a bankruptcy handled by a trustee, and they would be auctioned to buyers, uh, the highest bidder. Underwater mortgages would be trade at pennies on the dollar. Very, very dis deep discounts. And the buyers of those notes who would buy um, $200,000 mortgage, they might buy it for $80,000. The first thing they would do is go to borrowers and make a deal with them. Because they know the borrower probably wants to stay in their house, but it's hopeless. And so they would quickly renegotiate the debt down in terms of the principal payment. We're not talking about these phony lowering interest rate payments. You can't lower the interest any lower than it already is. So the issue here is the principal amount. If somebody buys a mortgage at 30 cents on the dollar, they would probably quickly turn around and rewrite that mortgage at 50 cents on the dollar, and everybody would go on about their business. And in fact, this is being done by a gentleman named Louis Ranieri. And he actually started the securitization of mortgages way back when for Solomon Brothers. Anybody who's read the book Liar's Poker uh, has heard of Louis Ranieri. And he has a company right now that is doing that, that very thing. Buying mortgages at a deep discount, turning around, contacting the borrowers, saying, listen, we did an appraisal on your house. You're way underwater. We've noticed you pay. And we'll make it, uh, a deal that will work for both of us. But a bailed out institution has no incentive to negotiate with anybody. Why should they? They're keeping, the, they're keeping these mortgages on their books at 100, percent, uh, 100 cents on the dollar. And they were able to do this with accounting changes made in March of 2009. These are specifically changes to FASB 157, 115, and 124 which allowed the banks to foreclose on homes without having to recognize a loss until the houses are sold. And essentially these new rules, which were sought by the American Bankers Association, not surprisingly, allow the banks to increase their reported profits and strengthen their balance sheets, allowing them to increase the reported value of their toxic assets. So one, while one side of this transaction gets bailed out by the government, they have Uncle Sam as their partner, underwater homeowners are subject to this browbeating by the likes of Henry Paulson and others in the press that they need to do the right and the moral thing by keep making their payments. Now in the ethics of liberty, Rothbard constructs an example of a theater owner contracting with an actor for a performance on a certain date. The actor changes his mind and doesn't appear. And he poses the question, should the actor be forced to appear? And Rothbard says, no, that would be slavery. Should the actor be forced to reimburse the theater owner for advertising and other expenses? And Rothbard says, no, they shouldn't be forced to pay for um, they shouldn't be forced to pay. This is the lack of foresight and poor entrepreneurship on the theater owner's part. But of course, if the actor had been paid and he doesn't perform, 
uh, should he be forced to return the money? Rothbard points out that problems like this are solved in a, republic, uh, in a libertarian society by requiring the um, actor to put, put up a perform performance bond. In short, if the theater owners wish to avoid the risk of noncompliance, they could re refuse to sign the agreement unless the actor posted such a bond. Well, in the case of mortgage defaults, the collateral of the loan, the homes, are essentially that performance bond. And when the borrower doesn't perform, that collateral is surrendered. Now, and to dovetail with that, the basic part of underwriting risk of a mortgage is to quote, uh, and this is a guy named Guy Stewart who, who wrote a book on uh, the mortgage business called Discriminating Risk, sure that the home, that lenders need to make sure that the home is sufficient value to cover the amount of the loan. That's a key part of underwriting. And if it doesn't satisfy the debt, in most cases, lenders can choose to go after the borrower's assets for any deficiency that, um, that they may have. And they can go out after that. Um, but any loss they take would be, in Rothbard's words, due to their lack of foresight and poor entrepreneurship. Now there's also this hue and cry of people walking away, destroying neighborhood values. You hear this deal all the time as if we have a duty to our neighbors. In the first place, nobody has that power. Denigrating the uh, uh, neighbor's property can be compared to uh, besmirching their good name in the case of slander and libel. Rothbard points out in For a New Liberty that what the law of libel and slander does, in short, is to argue that a property right of someone in his own reputation. In other words, a person has this property right to our, 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 uh, our reputation, but a person does not own a property right to his or her reputation. Or the repute, and at the same time, they don't own the reputed value of their home. The reputed value of the home is purely a function of the subjective feelings and attitudes held by other people. Now, I lifted that phrase from what Rothbard was talking about, what other people think of other people, in the terms of slander. But you can use it for home valuations as well. And the same, same thing happens here. It's the collective, the value of your home is the collective values and feelings of the marketplace. And you have no influence over that. So you have title your, to your property but you don't have ownership of these collective feelings and valuations. Now there's also this idea that defaulters raise the cost of borrowing, and, and, uh, but banks will even likelier offer good loan pricing um, if, they're, uh, if they're aware that property prices can decrease. Good borrowers will be even get better terms than they normally would. Uh, because they know that uh, property has the potential to, uh, to go down. And there is also the question of whether um, lenders even have taken entrepreneurial risk at all. We talked about they should pay the price for, for their entrepreneurial mistakes. But the federal government has made whole Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, Bank of America and the others, um, when they do well, uh, they're able to just go on and on and do their business. And if not, then the uh, taxpayers are left on the hook if they fail. I mean, it's heads I win and tails you lose. That's essentially the reverse uh, Robin Hood system, if you will. So, you might wonder, um, what our host thinks about all this. And I'm not sure what he thinks about it now, but uh, he, in, in an interview with the Austrian Economics Newsletter back in 1998, this was an interview um, with Professor Hoppe, Austrians in the Private Property Society. Uh, they asked him a, a question, um, and he said, in a free market, the level of risk people undertake as prescribed by property rights and strict liability. 
A person is bound by the terms of a contract, even if it means giving up everything he owns. In bankruptcy law, the states permit a certain group to act in violation of the contract they have agreed to. These types of laws create legal uncertainty and socialized risk. So when he was asked the follow-on question, what happens then if a debtor doesn't have the money to pay his creditors? Professor Hoppe said, it is the obligation of the creditor to see to it that he is protected against these types of contingencies. The outcome is dictated by the terms of the contract. The borrower may pay out of future income. If there is no provision in the contract for the borrowers going belly up, that's the lender's tough luck. He made a stupid contract. And what I would say is we have anything but a free market at the moment. But certainly lenders have made many stupid contracts and they should be made to pay for their tough luck. You know, it's said that libertarians um, always believe in self-defense. And in a way, for some people, the best financial self-defense is for them to walk away, to make sure that their family is taken care of. Yet, many of the same libertarians that believe in self-defense, being able to protect yourself, they side with the Henry Paulsons of the world, the big banking cartels that we've been talking about all morning today. Uh, they side with them preaching the same uh, message that you should keep paying and paying and paying till the end of time. Till you make your last, till your final breath, you should do all you can to make Fanny and Freddie whole. But I would say, and I finish every talk about this the same way, that no obituary will ever read, he was a good and ethical man. He died broke, his family suffered, but he never missed a payment to Fannie Mae. Thank you.